Good evening, everyone. I'm Gary Ferruja, the publisher of The Day and TheDay.com, and um, this is the first of what will be seven or eight municipal debates um, around the region. Uh, the Day started doing this uh, four years ago. Um, we had historically brought each candidate in uh, to meet with the editorial board, and that's how we would base our editorial endorsements. Uh, but we started this tradition because it was an opportunity for us to get out into the community, for the community to hear the candidates live, and for us to be able to actually record a debate and keep it archived on theday.com. So this debate that's happening tonight uh, will be the basis for the newspapers and the website's uh, endorsement. Um, I'm particularly interested in this one since this is my hometown, and tonight we have a debate uh, between the Republican incumbent, Mark Nickerson, on your right, and the Democratic opponent, Steve Carpentary. <laughs> if you could please silence your cell phones and uh, refrain from um, either applauding or booing as the candidates uh, give their response. We want them to uh, have all the time necessary here uh, there's another debate in the nation tonight I'm sure you might be interested in watching as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, editorial board editor, Paul Schwinier, who will be the moderator. Paul. All right, thank you very much. Uh, great turnout, East Lyme. See these many people coming out. See that uh, democracy is live and well um, here in East Lyme. Um, I imagine a few of you might have the DVRs going so you don't miss the beginning of the debate, uh, kind of the, the follow-up debate that's happening later on CNN, but uh, I think we're going to have a good show here tonight. A um, couple of thank yous before we get started and an explanation of our format. Um, I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut. They're going to be doing our timing tonight. I'd also like to thank the Board of Education and the Superintendent uh, Jeffrey Newton for letting us use this fine facility. And also our co-sponsors for the debate, the uh, Chamber of Commerce of Southeast and Connecticut. Um, the format we're going to use is both candidates are going to get an opening statement. And then we're going into the debate. Uh, there'll be a 25-minute running clock. So over the course of the debate, each candidate has 25 minutes. When they're talking, answering a question, rebutting what the other candidate had to say, that clock is running. And our timekeepers will let them know how much time they have left and they can use that as they see fit as we explore the different questions. I got a lot of questions from everyone, which is really great. Um, I can tell you right now, I won't get to all, all of them during our hour long debate, um, but I'm gonna try to focus on uh, the issues that were raised here, uh, especially which I had several cards on, a particular issue, I'll make sure I'll get to that uh, issue. So we're going to start with one minute opening statements and we used a flip of the coin uh, to determine the order and we're going to start with Mr. Carpentary with his opening statement. Steve. Thank you. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight to support myself and Mr. Nickerson. I think it's apparent that both candidates have considerable love for the town of East Lyme. For me it runs deep. I've made it my home for 45 years, and I'm fully vested in this town and its future. My son is a student in East Lyme School System, and my businesses are located here. I am the owner and operator of Lime Tavern Sports Bar and Restaurant and Rocky Neck Inn and Suites, in addition to owning several investment properties located in town. I've been an elected member of the Planning Commission for four years, the Zoning Commission for four years, and currently the Board of Finance for four years. My goals for East Lyme include, but are not limited to, sustaining the excellent educational environment for both students and staff, easing the burden on taxpayers while maintaining the quality of services, and ensuring smart economic growth. I have confidence that this town will continue to have a bright future, and I would be honored to be the first selectman, a leader who listens. Thank you very much. And Mark Nickerson, your comments. Thank you, Paul. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and engaging in the process of electing our first selectman. Our town is in a very enviable position. Our taxes have remained low and steady. Our schools are listed among the best in the state. Our beaches and walking trails are beautiful gifts that we treasure and take the time to care for. 
Our business community is thriving. The renaissance of Niantic Main Street has been the talk of the region all summer. But the best part of our town is the wonderful, caring people who volunteer in so many organizations that make a difference. From Karen Share to sports coaches, our people are great and therefore our town is great. It's been an honor to serve East Lyme, not just for the past year as first selectman, but for the past 16 years in various leadership positions. My business experience involvement in the region has given me the background necessary to lead our town. I'm proud of how this town has matured in the last 16 years, and I'm equally proud to say I've been part of the team. All right, very good. Um, just for our candidates, um, I'm kind of over here in the corner, but I want you to be talking to the audience, and also we have our camera on the day.com, which will be available uh, for viewing on the day.com after tonight. So I won't feel hurt if you're not looking at me when you answer the question. I want you to look at the audience. Uh, the first question goes to Steve, Co Steve Carpenteri. And um, we've got a lot of questions on the Gateway Project and uh, some recent decisions concerning that project. So I think we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, one of our first question was, uh, does the town have sufficient assurances that the commercial portion of Gateway will happen, would you approach this project any differently than the current administration? Uh, in any commercial, I'm sorry. In any commercial development, there is, there is no 100% guarantee that it'll be completed. A developer could walk at any given time. But I think the things that we've seen, the things that we've heard um, from the developers, uh, through the Zoning Commission, through the Board of Selectmen's meetings um, and what they've done, the money they've spent, the architects they've hired, the engineers, uh, they're going to bond the road. Um, it, it appears to me that it looks like they are committed to it um, from what I've, what I've seen. Um, Mark, if you could kind of talk about that, the, the, the assurances um, uh, that we'll see the commercial portion of that. Um, this is nothing, nothing's guaranteed, but we have a signed lease on, on a big box coming into this development. And that's important for economic growth. It's important for our tax base. Uh, we have a signed lease, and these folks have come to the table three times now with site plan review information. They're on board. The state is committed to $40 million to improve exit 74 and the on and off ramps. $40 million invested in East Lyme for our economic growth, for our tax base. Also, the regional uh, COG, the Council of Governments, has um, committed, is about to commit, commit to $3 million for the improvement of Flanders Road. It's, everybody's on board here. There's a big picture involved here. We're, we're very sure that, that this development is gonna happen. And Mark, uh, following up on that question, um, we had, we had a question here is, is, why did you see fit to interject yourself into the Zoning Commission hearing and argue in favor of the Gateway expansion to 400 apartments, um, especially given the fact that your Planning Commission concluded the expansion was not in keeping with the plan of conservation and development? I'll start with the Planning Commission first. I have two in my folder tonight, anyone wants to see them at the end, two decisions by the Planning Commission in the past that has approved this as meeting the plan of development. I, th I thought the uh, Zoning Commission didn't, wasn't getting all the necessary answers and all the information. So I did take it upon myself to make sure they understood the big picture, to make sure they understood that Costco has signed a lease, that the state has committed to the bridge and the, uh, the on and off ramps, and the, and the regional uh, COG is considering and will more than likely commit to a, a, a development on Flanders Road. They needed to hear that. They also needed to hear that our town, although it is a bedroom community and we do treasure our neighborhoods, is woefully short in tenant housing. Our sons and daughters can't move back to this town between college and when they finally have enough money after paying tuition and, and getting solid in a job and being able to afford a mortgage. Our son and daughters can't live here. So, uh, yes, we're way under uh, average of uh, tenant housing in uh, this marketplace. And you know what? Uh, 10 buildings are built right now. 
The fear factor is gone. We, we have apartments up there. The, the sky has not fallen. Uh, we have five extra kids in our, in our school system. We're down 60 kids this year from last year in our school system uh, because we have a declining enrollment. So if more kids come in, it's not necessarily going to blow up the schools and we'll need to have another one. It will, uh, it, it, they will offset and there'll be balance. Uh, Steve, uh, any comment from you on the, uh, the intensity of development and whether is that should be of any concern to East Lyme? Son has had a huge growth spurt, and I, and I think uh, it's time. If you could use your microphone just to uh, make sure people can hear you. Thank you. East Lyme has had a, a very large growth spurt, and I think uh, it's time that we pay attention, finish what's going on, and then think about where we're going and, and what else we need for development. Um, um, we, and just to elaborate on that, we, we had a particular concern about the the traffic issues we already see on a stretch of I-95 uh, in that area. Um, do you see that, that a way of improving that situation with this development, or could it aggravate it? And what would you do at First Selectman to make sure it, it, it's, the, it's the former, that things improve on that stretch of road? Well, they, they have plans of widening the road to six lanes. Um, the DOT in the state of Connecticut has plans to redo all of that because it has been a problem over the years, even not just now. Uh, on the weekends, it gets, it gets crowded. And if I was first selected, I would certainly work with the town and I would work with the state and the DOT to make sure that it gets done. And, and Mark, on the concern we had from a questioner about uh, uh, the traffic situation we've seen and with a big development like that, what happens? 95 is a death trap. 95 is a death trap between Old Lyme and East Lyme. I've already asked the state police to start patrolling it better. We need a constant police presence in those five miles. But to speak to your question about uh, the economic growth, that's why the state is putting in the $40 million. Right now, you have, if you're coming from Groton and you want to get off at where pools, et cetera, is, you're going 55 miles an hour, and you're slamming on your brakes to get to 15 miles an hour to make that hairpin turn on two wheels. We need safer on and off ramps. That's part of the problem is the on ramps coming onto this highway, which is about to split into two different highways, which is improperly signed. And then we have people from uh, exit 75 cutting over to 395. It's a death trap. We have to stop the carnage and, and fix the roads. This plan will fix Flanders Road because right now all the cars that are weaving in and out of Flanders Road, six lanes on Flanders Road will give proper turns, put a light on it, and, and, and have people drive safely on Flanders Road. Right now there's too many accidents, and 95 will be a better road because of this. All right, thank you. Um, um, Mr. Carpenter, anything more on that topic of the, of, of, of the uh, Gateway Project before we move on to other questions we've gotten? I wanted to give you a... An opportunity. Uh, more about Gateway? If you so choose. There were some comments from your opponent. I, I didn't want to, before I moved on, I wanted to give well, you that Gateway, opportunity. Uh, Gateway is, uh, is a huge project, and I believe that if it is completed as planned and by what was approved by the town, it can and will be a big asset to the town. Um, it'll bring in tax dollars. It'll bring in jobs. People will live here. People will commute. They will shop here. It's, it's, it makes it a destination location, and it, and it really will be... Um, very, very good for the town of East Lyme. All right. Uh, so the next question is to you, uh, Mr. Carpenteri, and from one of our audience members, how do you propose to sustain uh, the increasing infrastructure staff, new school construction that's planned, and still keep the town debt under control? That's a good one. <laughs> we, we need to cut back to two schools. Um, we need to renovate one as new. We need to tear down one and rebuild it. Uh, there's been a study already going on, and the, and the Board of Education has already decided. Um, all the numbers aren't in yet, but it's, it's going to be costly, and, and we'll have to bond it. And, and um, there was a vote earlier this week, um, $9,000 uh, allocated to uh, study the reuse of the school that will be vacated uh, when the school project renovation projects begin. Um, did you agree with that vote? How would you? Uh, what approach did you take to uh, coming up with the proper reuse for that building? Well, I wasn't at that meeting, 
But I think uh, until it is definitely approved by the Board of Education, then possibly we should wait before we spend that money. We also have plenty of smart people in our town, our engineers that maybe could look at it. Um, so, uh, 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 Mr. Nickerson, um, the question was, uh, how do you propose to sustain the increasing infrastructure staff, this new school project, and yet keep uh, town debt under control? It's a good question. We need new schools, and we do need to invest as a community in these schools. It's going to cost us money. Our, 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 t our mill rate will go up. But will our property values also go up because we're a community that invested in its schools? What happens to your property values? And the number one thing that drives your property values is, are the schools. That's why many of us moved here. Um, what happens if we don't invest? What, if, what happens if we're the community 10 or 20 years from now that never built those schools? I don't want to be saying we've got to keep up with the Joneses, but our schools are crumbling. And we need to either put 10 or 20 million dollars into old, old schools or invest wisely to, to schools of the future. And, and on the issue of the Lillian Haynes School, um, was that vote arguably premature to, you know, and, and why couldn't the town of East Lyme uh, have the resources itself without hiring a consultant to figure out the possible future use of that building. It was a consultant. We were getting a uh, much cheaper uh, bang for the dollar. 9000 was originally quoted at 45000 Listen, nine, if this is a $90 million school budget uh, program, then not 1%, but one-tenth of 1% is $9,000, which is to try to figure out and to be able to communicate on this stage in a month when the school board is coming to you saying, this is our new plan. When you ask the question, what are you going to do with the Lily B? We would have intelligent answers what could go in that building. Would a police station work in there? Would the town hall work in there? Parks and Rec, youth services. Not only that, what would go into the current town hall? Would the police station go there? Would the, can the library swing over and use the whole building? What about the senior center? That's what we were paying for. And it's just an intelligent, for $9,000 to be, uh, be able to come up here and say, listen, we don't have the architectural drawings, but these things could work in this building. And we will take um, the building of a new library, the building of a new police station, which has been on our capital plan, we'll take them off the plan. Mr. Carpenter? I, I agree with the $9,000, but I think it should have been done after it was totally approved that Lily B. Haynes would be given back to the town. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Nickerson, you get the first crack at the next question, uh, again from our audience. Uh, what are your views about regionalization? Uh, and if reelected, how will you work with surrounding communities to promote regionalization? As first selectman, I got to look in your eyes and say I'm doing everything I can to reduce your taxes. And that might be the gateway and the economic development of this town. We only have 4% um, uh, commercial uh, area zoned as commercial. Uh, so, you know, the gateway is one thing. But to go back to your question on regionalization, we already regionalize. We have an animal control a regionalization program with Waterford. Our, our schools, we've combined our high school with Salem, and we're looking at 7th and 8th grade as well. Our water connection is a great example of regionalization. We, we took towns and put them together and say, let's fix the water pro pro problem. Excuse me. For 30 years, we've had shortages, shortages of water. And this year was the first year we didn't have a mandatory water restriction. Uh, our state trooper system is a regional approach. It's a state and the towns working together. And the gateway Council of Government investment of $3 million is also a regional program. Those are the things that we're already doing. Will we explore more? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carpenteri. Um, your comments on regionalization and what you would do as first selectman to promote it. I also agree with regionalization. And if it can be done to save the town's money, it's, it's, it's in the best interest. Uh, except on certain areas uh, with unions and some of the labor, I think they would have to probably work together um, before that could be worked out, like the uh, 911 emergency, you know, uh, that would have to be worked out because there's three different unions. Mm -hmm. So I think if they work that out, uh, regionalization is a very good idea. Um, take just a second, maybe we could get uh, where our candidates are doing on their time 
Um, <laughs> yes, time left. Okay. I right, already have a little imbalance, but um, the next question is going to Mr. Carpenteri, so uh, maybe we can balance it out a little. Uh, Ledger recently uh, decided to end its resident state trooper program. Uh, it's going to be hiring its own police chief to run its own department. Um, East Lyme has a similar resident uh, state trooper arrangement. Um, do you see any need, uh, any uh, possibility in the foreseeable future of East Line potentially going in that direction? Yes, I do. Um, it, it is quite possible. With the growth and the development that's been going on in this town, uh, we may need more services um, like, the, like the police. And um, depending upon the cost, uh, I, I think it would, it, it would, would benefit the town. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on, you know, what would be the benefit and what maybe um, might have the town thinking about changing? Is it, is it simply the, the degree of development you're facing or there might be other factors? Well, the town is getting larger. There's more development. There's, uh, you know, like Mr. Nixon said, we need more police presence on the highways. We need probably more police presence in our town. Um, and... Um, you know, that would, that would be the reason. Um, Mr. Nickerson. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's blinking red. Um, police. Yes, we are already studying independent, mm -hmm. going independent. I love the fact that Ledger's doing it first. We can learn from their mistakes. We can discover the costs. There's significant increased costs in going independent. If you take a look at any local police force, Take Waterford, they're our sister town. Uh, they have a significantly, significantly more expensive police force than, than, uh, than we're currently paying right now. There's great value to have the state trooper. The $200,000 we'll pay for the state trooper brings a lot of other value. And uh, my time is, is, is running short, so I don't want to go deep into this question as much as we are looking at it. I'll bring another point up. We're a town of 19,000 people. During the summer months, they say our population doubles. But then add all the people at, at Rocky Neck and the people that visit our downtown and, and our house guests. We have 50 souls in this town on a hot summer July day. We need more than three policemen uh, operating at any one time. There's, there's times in this community we need a lot more than three people in, in, in patrol cars. And we're going to look into that as well. Whether we go independent or not, we need to, to take a careful eye and look at that. Um, speaking of a hot July day, we have a uh, question, um, uh, and this, uh, this is for Mark Nickerson, you the next question. Um, do you believe humans are contributing to, to climate change, and what steps is East Lyme taking to prepare for it? A climate change question. Listen, we are a shoreline town, and if you believe the climate change scenario, and I believe, I do, based on the, uh, the intensity of hurricanes that we experience and the storms, um, you know, we, we have to uh, do, we need to consider that. Houses are being built now with better standards. There's a better business practice uh, through our building department. Our, our boardwalk that is being rebuilt is being built 100% with steel and cement. And that's some of the ways we're building that. Um, Mr. Carpenteri, um, what, what, well, your views on climate change and what should East Line be doing to prepare for it? Uh, as Mr. Nichols said, it's a shoreline community. Well, I guess building stronger houses, build, rebuilding the boardwalk to be safer, and taking necessary precautions on their own homes um, would, would probably be the answer. Um, and well, Next question goes to you. Um, you're, you're a Democrat. What democratic principles would be reflected in your leadership of East Lyme if you're elected first electman? Well, we want, to, we want to ensure an excellent school system. We want to try to reduce taxes if we can. We want to protect open space. Um, and I'll give the same opportunity to Mr. Nickerson, uh, uh, Republican. What, you know, uh, 
Oh, you're running under party labels. What, uh, what Republican principles might be reflected in your leadership if uh, reelected? Well, all of the above. <laughs> but I'll also say that in town politics, what, what makes it work is at the end of the day, we don't act as like Republicans or Democrats. We act as volunteers and elected official for you. John Kennedy said, I like this one, it's on my website, let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. We do that in East Lyme, and that's why government works in small towns. That's why it's not working in Hartford or in Washington, D.C. So let's not take our cues from there. Let's, let's work together here. Okay, Ms. Mr. Nicholson, I got a question here, and I can't vouch for the accuracy of the background, so if, I, if it's wrong, I'm sure you'll correct us. Um, uh, the questioner was pointing out that athletic fields are expensive to create and maintain, and in this questioner's opinion, he feels that East Lyme has more than a sufficient number already, but he says there's $4 million in the budget to be spent for an additional field, uh, and that will generate more maintenance costs. Do you feel the town needs another playing field, and if so, how do you justify it? And Mr. Nicholson, you get the first crack at that. Um, you know, and I don't know the answer that if, that if we have four million dollars in our budget, it may be in the long range capital improvement plan that we have. Uh, we do have space on Roxbury Road, and that's where this question is coming from. And that land was donated by the prison several years ago during the Hogan administration to put playing fields there. Listen, even though our school population is going down, and the studies show that in the next 10 years we're going to lose 20 percent of the families with school age kids in this town. Our playing fields are maxed out. Our kids play longer seasons. They're playing more sports. Um, the, the little girls are playing like the boys. So they're all out there. And what a good thing for a community to have active kids. Our, 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 our Parks and Rec Department will tell you that we do need new playing fields. But we have a lot of priorities ahead of that. We have schools to build. Uh, no matter what the plan is, we have schools to build. And we have some other priorities too. So. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, the, the, the question is one if uh, do we have enough athletic fields or, or if you're a first selectman, do you support investing in, in that resource? We have quite a few athletic fields. And, and not that I'm against having any more, but I think there are more important things to use that money for with the upcoming schools. And I think that's where I think I'd rather use it first. Um, Give me sorting through questions here. Um, going to the uh, another topic I received a few questions on here, trying to sort through is the Oswegatchie Hills. Um, and let's start off with you, Mr. Carpenteri. Um, was the memorandum of understanding with developer Glenn Russo the best way to prevent housing de housing development in Oswegatchie Hills? And would your strategy on that issue differ? differ in any form from that of the current administration? Well, I, I think it's up to the uh, different commissions in the town, such as the planning and the zoning, to deal with that. Uh, I think it has its own issues uh, as far as safety, as far as the infrastructure, uh, and all those things need to be addressed, and, and it would be left up to them. That would be the bottom line. Um, whether I'm for it or against it, I, I really don't think I should say right now. Um, but the man you're trying to unseat um, seemed to take a very active involvement in seeking out a memorandum of understanding. Uh, would you, did you agree with that approach? It sounds like maybe you didn't since you feel the first segment perhaps shouldn't be that involved in, 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 in dealing with the issue. So if you kind of address that, the question was interested in your view on that. Well, I don't have his, mem his uh, memorandum. I don't know the knowledge in it. I don't know the paperwork, uh, what it consists of. Um, Ms. Nickerson, that was your, um, if you could talk about why you did that and where does that stand? Um, where it stands is where it stood, which means we're working toward a peaceful resolution rather than not so peaceful, which means tractors rolling up and down uh, Oswegatchie Hills. There's nothing more important than this town, I'll say this real loud and real clear, than the, the protection and preservation of Oswegatchie Hills. Whether you live at the tip of Old Black Point or way up on Whistletown Road, the protection of, of, of Oswegatchie Hills is critical. 
We don't need 1,700 units on that hill. We also don't need what's going to happen to the, the Niantic River as a result of massive amounts of housing on that hill. That needs to be protected. So strategy, I don't know if it was the best strategy, it was an additional strategy. We're working hard. Nobody in this town has worked longer on the protection of Osagacha Hills than myself. I was two weeks on the job in zoning as a chairperson, and in comes the landmark development group trying to develop Oswegatchie Hills. So I've been on the zoning, I was on zoning 16 years ago, about 15 years ago this thing started. And we've had four or five applications and we're doing our level best to make sure we, we prove to appeal judges that this is not a proper place for multifamily, especially of that magnitude. The memorandum of understanding, I'll run out of time if I go all the way through it, but it's just an opportunity that he agrees to as well, that if we can find space in a neighboring town, not neighboring, it could be the other side of the state, it could be up in Boston, it could be in the beltway of New York City, uh, of, New, of Washington, D.C. If the state or the federal government uh, comes across land that's ripe for development, they want it developed, that we might be able to trade development rights with, from this land to that land, and he walks away from this land. Um, just to clarify, Mr. Carpenter, it sounds like you might have a different approach from the earlier question. You sound like, if I heard you right, you said this should be up to the, the Land Use Commission. It's not like you wouldn't insert yourself into whether this is a good idea or a bad idea as aggressively as Mr. Nickerson. So if you could kind of elaborate and clarify that. Well, no, after I listened to that, I, I, I do remember that. I do remember hearing about that, and I do agree with that. I, I think if we can get him to find another piece of property somewhere on the state or maybe even another country, that would be good. Um, I think that land absolutely should be protected and preserved, and it should not be built. I absolutely agree with that. All right, thank you. Um, next question uh, goes to Steve. Um, the Questioner wants to know, what do you see as the greatest obstacle to be faced by the town of East Lyme in the next four years? Biggest obstacle. Well, I would say there's probably two. The completion of the schools and Gateway. And, and, your, and your thoughts as you go into that, your first selectman, if, you know, what's your view on those? Well, the schools need to be completed. Um, as you know, uh, they did a study and they, they want to uh, re rebuild, renovate, excuse me, Niagara Center School as new. They want to uh, tear down Flanders School and build a new school, take Lillaby Haynes, give it back to the town, and then we'll shuffle around the police station, the town hall, and make some changes there. Now, I need, you know, that's a big project. That's an expensive project. Even though we're going to get money from the state, it, it needs to be done. It needs to be done correctly. So... <clears throat> so the kids have a beautiful facility to keep learning, and it's good economics for this town because that's why people come here. Um, and then Gateway, uh, that project is huge. It's probably the biggest thing this, this town has ever seen or ever will see. And it needs to be completed as planned, as what was approved by zoning and planning. And if it is, like I said earlier, it's a great asset to the town. But I think those are the two biggest things we're faced with in the next three to four years. Do you see a correlation between the two uh, in that one um, will raise revenue and the other one will spend money? You could say that. <laughs> We're going to spend probably $90 million on the schools, and we probably, my guess would be about $2 million in tax revenue from, from Gateway. I could be a little off, but I'm guessing. Uh, Mr. Nickerson, uh, what do you see as the biggest the obstacles facing uh, East Lyme in the next uh, four years, and how do you address them? Yeah, uh, Steve's right. It's the schools and, and getting through this obstacle. Not that any obstacle, obstacle can't be overcome. We have great town government. We have volunteers all over this town. We do have smart people, and listening to the, um, to the people will give us the answers that we need. But yeah, we, we have some major building that has to happen in this town to rebuild these schools and to, you know, the, the cost of moving a town hall or moving the police station in or, um, or, or expanding the library uh, over to the other side of the wing, that's going to be expensive, an obstacle, if you will, uh, but we'll get through it. 
The other side of it is uh, we do have a, a, a nice revenue source coming in. It sh I'm hoping for more like 2.5 to $3 million of tax revenue out of that whole plan when it's all said and done. It, we could pay down some of the debt that way. I had, a better, I had another plan, and, and we have to have a community conversation about this, but our teachers are woefully underpaid. We lose good teachers every year, young good teachers to other school systems because we pay $10,000, $15,000 less than the going rate in our marketplace. So you know, it'd be nice to lockbox some of that money and send it off to the, to the teacher's wages. Um, they need, we're losing talent. If you're building good schools and you don't have magic in the classroom, why bother? So that's a plan I'd like to have as a community, a, a conversation I'd like to have as a community. Mr. Carpenter, it sounds like you might want to, after hearing him, uh, any, any further comment on the obstacles and uh, uh, I agree with that. And, and with, with the, uh, the uh, dropping down to two schools, we will save probably at least three quarters of a million dollars in cost. Uh, I also think that we have a new uh, superintendent of schools, Jeff Newton. I, I think. He's going to be tremendous for the job, and I think he will probably work very closely with the Board of Selectmen, First Selectmen, no matter which one it is, and, and work closely to try to use their budget a little bit wisely, and maybe we can save some dollars there and, and also use those dollars to, to give the better teachers better pay. Uh, next question goes to Mr. Nickerson. Um, got a couple of questions uh, concerning Niantic. I think you said in the opening remarks about uh, the progress in Niantic, um, and they note that in these questions, but they're also concerned uh, about whether the progress will actually begin to detract uh, from the quality that made Niantic so attractive to begin with. So um, I, I guess the question is, how, would you, how do you balance you know, the economic growth there without ruining what made it uh, so special? And we'll start with Mr. Nickerson. Could I take a time out and find out uh, the You certainly the can. Thank if, you. Uh, could show our candidates how we're doing? Three seconds. <laughs> we have uh, 18 minutes for Mr. Carpenter and 12 minutes, did I see? Okay. I, I'm going I'm to have to make some, some answers real short. So, I, um, so the, the vibrant downtown that we have will not be ruined. We're not expanding it. We're not putting big boxes in downtown. It is busy, and a busy downtown is a good downtown. For too long, we had nobody downtown. We had empty storefronts. We had stores that people didn't want to go to. We have a vibrant downtown, and that's because years ago, we said we didn't need to beautify it. We need people living downtown, and we need to encourage restaurants and retail to, to come to our area, make a contribution, make an investment, take a risk in Niantic. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, now that you know Niantic is, there has been progress there. You know, how would you manage that development uh, so you don't hurt the quality of life in Niantic? Well, years ago, it, it's true. Downtown Niantic was, was getting very scarce. I mean, there was a lot of empty stores. Um, you couldn't fill anything. There was a lot of empty rents, and and then people decided to put some money into the town. They decided to do the boardwalk. The boardwalk has been a, a magnificent addition to the town. Um, and then adding the restaurants and the shops and everybody just getting together and, and trying to do something with it. They've, they've made it kind of like a mystic, if you will. And it, it, it really is a beautiful, beautiful town. And I, and I think it, uh, as years to come, it's just going to get better and better. And I think, I think we need it. It's, it's a jewel for, the, for, for East Lime. It really is. It's, it's a jewel. And uh, we just have to make sure we can get a handle on some of the parking problems and work some of the bugs out of it. But, but I think we can do that. Um, and and it, it Mystic, you know, uh, is very popular, but it, it also can be pretty, pretty daunting with parking, getting around sometimes for the, for the locals in, in the summertime. Um, any ideas as you look forward into uh, steps that might be taken? Uh, and, and I'll give you a chance, and it looks like Mr. Nickerson might, might want to add a little on that, because that, that seemed to be the question. Or is there no concern that the development, uh, you know, will cause problems with quality of life in Niantic? Well, what's happening with the parking, it's taking a lot of the commercial parking away from the commercial businesses because of the people that come to town to vacation at our beaches. So that's becoming a problem. 
and it needs to be addressed because soon the other half of uh, Cheney Park, is, that beach is going to open and it's going to bring even more people in. So we have a few options, I think, downtown for more parking. Um, but I had another plan that I thought would work, um, if anybody's interested in hearing it. Uh, we That's have why we're here. Pardon me? That's why we're here. So we, we have a piece of real estate right across the street from the uh, prison. And, and that was originally where the public safety building was going to go. I believe we can get it from the state pretty easily. And it's about three acres. We could put a parking lot there. Uh, Mr. Nickerson and I think even prior to him had talked about a trolley running through town. We could do a trolley from Rocky Neck to that parking lot to bring people to the downtown beaches. Uh, and I think that may relieve some of the parking problem. Uh, VFW has some land that could be used for parking. And also McCook's Park, once the renovations are done, they have a staging area. And that could uh, easily accommodate maybe another 50 or 60 or possibly 70 cars. So, you know, collectively with all these things, I think we can, we can make a difference and possibly solve the problem or, or at least make a big difference in it. Um, Mr. Nickerson, did you want to say any more on, on the topic? Let's, let's stay on that. Yeah, we're going to add 78 more parking spaces that are already, th more than that's already there at the top of McCook's. That's already part of the plan of the new build walk, boardwalk build out. We're also, I'm also talking to Father Tony of St. John's. Nice guy. And he's talking about that gravel lot behind St. John's. We can make a connection road from the hole in the wall parking lot. And this plan was already done up several years ago, uh, drawn up. So we could fit a couple hundred cars there on a busy Saturday in July. We're also talking about a trolley downtown. We can park cars. We, we need to do a better job of directing traffic in our town, saying, here, park here, get on the trolley, and we'll take you somewhere. Uh, we'll, we'll, we can park cars at Niantic Center during the summer. Uh, at the town hall has got 100 spaces. We're not using that on Saturdays and Sundays. At Vets Field, when it's not being used, there's a couple other lots in town too. Churches on Saturdays, Rings End on Sundays. There's spaces out there. And we'll run a trolley on a loop. It will bring our folks over to Cheney Park, which is bigger than twice the size of, the, if you take our McCooks and our hole in wall beach and put them together, Cheney Park is twice as big as that. So with the new bathrooms that have been approved, we got a half a million dollar grant last week from the state of Connecticut to build bathrooms down at, in Cheney Park, permanent bathrooms, not porta toilets. Um, we, we, that's a vibrant breach, and that's where we can encourage our visitors to go. Plus, they'll be on a trolley, so when they come back, we'll make a stop on, right down on Main Street so they can get off and do some shopping and walking around first. Thank you. Um, next question goes to Mr. Carpentary. Um, one of the things you see from Niantic is the Millstone Nuclear Power Plant. Um, recently, the Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, decided to cancel a study into whether communities around nuclear plants have higher cancer rates. Uh, the study included millstone. Um, should the town object to the cancellation of that study before it reaches its conclusions, or uh, are you satisfied with the NRC's position? Clarify that question. They canceled the study of yeah, cancer research? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission was, was in the midst of a study uh, to determine if they, are there higher cancer rates around nuclear plants? They picked several plants to look at. Millstone was among them and they were collecting data in the midst of the study and they decided the expense would be too much. They weren't sure on the conclusions, so they, they canceled the study. Uh, as a community close to Millstone, uh, just wondering, in your first selectman, do you have any issues with that um, or, or not? Yes, I do. With all the money Dominion has, I think they should continue that study. No questions asked. All right, thank you. Uh, you were first selected, Ms. Nickerson. I don't know if you spoke up about that decision. I'd like to get your thoughts. I was disappointed to hear that the study got canceled. We all have loved ones in this community that are suffering with cancer or have passed on because of cancer, and our families live here. We should know the whole truth, and I'll pass the time on the, uh, for the rest. Um, and and um, Mr. Nickerson, while on the topic, um, do you think the region is being aggressive enough about the fact that the federal government has not fulfilled its obligation to begin removing the high-level waste at Millstone? It's becoming a de facto storage area because we have no federal facility. Um, 
but it doesn't seem like the, t the local community is very aggressive in demanding a change. And so just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that issue. Uh, again, real quick, uh, I, I think it was a mistake to abandon Yucca Mountain. Is it Yucca Mountain? That's Way right. out there. We need a, a national facility or regional facilities to store this material. It should not be stored on site. Um, and I was very disappointed when, well, I'm very frustrated that we as a nation have used this as a political football and not come to a, a conclusion uh, on where to put this stuff. Um, Mr. Carpenter was, you know, was a Democratic president, a Democratic uh, uh, leader of the Senate who um, uh, pulled the plug on Yucca Mountain. Your thoughts on, on East Lyme's position if you were first selectman? On which position? On the, on the fact that um, Millstone, which is in your view of Nyanic, uh, it's become a storage area for the high level waste produced by that reactor. It's supposed to be, uh, in the original agreement, moved to a federal facility. Uh, abs I absolutely agree that should be moved. That's, that's, that's horrible that they would have that stockpile on that, on there. That should be moved. It should be either the government's responsibility or Dominion's. But somebody should take charge and move that. All right, thank you. I think um, I want to check the time now because uh, we're getting into the last part of our debate, so I'll just take a moment. You remember the Boston Garden when they were really slow on the, on the clock? <laughs> During the red hour back days, if we could, yeah, go slow. <laughs> did you get your times? I was trying to, we did, okay. Um, you guys are doing so, we answer questions here. I'm running a little short, but bear with me a second. Um, uh, and the next question is to Mark Nickerson. And, um, it's, it may be more of a, a, a Board of Ed question, but um, uh, the, the question was interested in your position. Uh, can you see any way of correcting the racial imbalance in the elementary schools in East Lyme? Um, it's uh, uh, you know, largely uh, not a diverse community uh, racially. Any approaches you can see the town taking to uh, diversify our student population? You know, I don't have an easy answer for that. I don't think there is one. I'd be willing to listen to you all if there, if there is an answer to this. Um, we live in a community that is increasingly being um, uh, sought out by all, that is becoming more diverse. I think our magnet schools and our specialty schools are allowing our children to explore other uh, educations and therefore being exposed to more uh, a more diverse population. Um, there's no e easy answer to that, I'm afraid. Uh, you want to take a crap at Mr. Carpenter? <laughs> He's absolutely right. There is no answer to, easy answer to that question. Uh, if someone has a good idea, uh, I know I would be. I would love to hear it. Uh, maybe that question. I might have one after the debate. You could uh, talk to our candidates. Um, uh, and this is for um, um, Steve uh, and. The question uh, concerns the, but the, the question to consider is the lack of affordable housing in the community. Um, the, the Gateway Project is, is technically not being defined as affordable housing. Um, were there any steps you would take or you envision if you're first selectman uh, to try to increase the stock of affordable housing in East Lyme? And Mr. Carpenter, you get first crack at that. Well, there, there are a few places in East Lyme uh, that I think the other administration had chose to, to put affordable housing. Uh, affordable housing, obviously, is, is the cost. Um, if, you can buy, if you can buy real estate reasonably and you can get it built reasonably, um, and then you can probably do it affordably. Um, but East Lyme is, is a fairly expensive town with real estate. And, uh, but, but fortunately, the zoning regulations are such that you can put more on a piece of property and affordable than you can uh, with regular regulations. So if a person wants to try, and, and there are people out there doing it. There are affordable housing units going up. So it, it, it's out there and it can be done. 
Ms. Nickerson, is the town doing enough to broaden out its uh, housing stock with affordable housing? Um, your, your view? This town has done more for affordable housing than any other town in our region, to my knowledge. We've added a lot of affordable housing developments. The problem is the state defines affordable housing uh, with certain qualifications. They don't count a single family home that might be a small home that might be really affordable to the typical working class person. Uh, it had their, their, their certain definitions and they have to be in these developments and all. We have a HEPA, we have um, the uh, 38 Hope Street, those are a couple buildings that came on when I was on zoning commission that we approved and there's been other developments as well some approved some not appro uh, some approved some not built um, we have done a great deal for affordable housing as compared to some of our neighbors should we do more well we don't build the houses the developers do and they can come with a project but they have to be appropriate they have to be in the right place on the water and sewer line maybe next to an artery where we can run some seat buses down there so these folks can get to work if they don't have transportation um, th that's important too um, and the question I wanted, uh, another question, this goes to uh, Mr. Nickerson. Um, uh, do you anticipate sewers will be installed in Saunders Point? Is that where we're headed? And uh, what influence do you anticipate that will have on future development in that area of town? Well, I swear I didn't write that question. I did not. Uh, we just got approval after years, and I'm talking six years, eight years, of asking the state DEEP to allow us to put sewers in Saunders Point. But you know, the DEP really kind of controls that. They finally gave us um, uh, a scope of study uh, grant and approval, which means we can go in and figure out what it's gonna cost and what the engineering is gonna be required for sewers in Saunders Point. We need sewers in Saunders Point. Again, no matter where you live, that's important because of what's, what it does to the Niantic River. And we all have a stake in that game. Um, will it further development in Saunders Point? Absolutely not. It's sold out now. Just ask any of the neighbors there. Uh, they're house on top of house on top of house. And very bad septic and cesspools are in that area. We need, uh, hey, we, we put, Saunders, we put uh, sewers in Pine Grove and we, we uh, improve the nitrogens going into the Niantic River by 90%. That's, that's what we're going with here and that's why DEP gave us an approval. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, he's absolutely right. Oops. He is absolutely right. Uh, the nitrogen that was going into the uh, river from Pine Grove was was diminished almost to nothing because of city sewers. Saunders Point has the same problem. It's fully developed. Once it has city sewers, that problem will will be resolved, and any bad septic systems will be will be gone. Um, we we've seen in some coastal communities you get sewers and those little maybe cottages become bigger and bigger homes, the lots get brought up and consolidated. Um, anything to prevent that, or is that any concern, or, or, sh or is it a concern? The question goes to? Uh, it's on Mr. Carpenter. Well, I, I think most of Saunders Point is pretty well developed. If you've ever been down there, the, the homes are, are, are really, really built, they're really nice. Uh, whether anybody's gonna tear down a couple houses and build a bigger one, or or do any kind of expansion. I don't know, it, it looks like it's, it, it's already pretty much maxed out and uh, it's actually, it's a beautiful area. And, and because Nick, it sounds like you agree with that, that the concern about uh, increased development is not. Uh, no, no, that, that is a central question or concern in a beach community when you do this. Old Lyme is going through it now. It got very political over there because they're considering putting sewers in. Of course, they'll run their waste through our system and will benefit, uh, our Water and Sewer Commission will benefit for that. But um, yes, the, the danger is that small little two bedroom little thing turns into this monster. And we control that with zoning, period. You control that with zoning, and you don't, and you control the expansion based on square footage of a house on a square footage of a yard. Um, for our timekeepers, going to show our candidates what time we're getting down to near the end of the hour. Um, <clears throat> Can I see it too, there, uh, timekeeper? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Six yeah, I don't think we're going to get. Uh, they're going to get to use all your time somehow. Uh, because we're almost up on the hour and <laughs> they got plenty of time left. So uh, 
the math always somehow doesn't <laughs> quite work out. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, the next question to you, pretty straightforward, but uh, I think a good question. Uh, why did you want to run for first selectman of East Lyme? I'm running for first selectman because... The microphone, just to make sure again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm running for first selectman because I've lived in this town for 45 years and have watched it grow significantly due to our excellent educational system and our beautiful coastline and small town charm. During, the growth, during this growth, our taxes have increased to provide the services people in this town have come to expect. Our development growth needs to be controlled and scrutinized. We must proceed with caution. I've watched this growth as a citizen and now feel that after serving 12 years on town boards, it's time for me to have a bigger impact on East Lem's future. Um, Mr. Nickerson, uh, so why do you want to be first selectman again? <laughs> you know, I didn't seek this job out. I really didn't. It, it, it found me. Um, I, I very much enjoyed the leadership positions I've had as chairman of zoning and, and being Paul Formica's deputy first selectman for five years. I learned a lot through Paul. Um, and with Paul moving on, it was an opportunity. And I thought, I, we'll try it out for a little bit, but I've, I've learned to love this job. The opportunity to solve problems, to listen to people, to have the 30,000 foot view of the whole town and put people together and put ideas together. It's, um, it's, it's, it suits me well. I've been 25 years in business managing people and managing projects and, um, um, you know, and I love this town. There's a sense of pride in this town that, um, I don't think happens everywhere. We have a sense of place. We have, a, we, have, we have hometown pride like I don't think any other town has. And that's why I want to be here. It's for the people. It's for this town. All right, thank you. Um, uh, next question is to Mr. Nickerson. And um, I had, uh, I know we, had, we spent the first few questions on Gateway. I got many more. So since we have a little time left before our hour is up, um, one of the questions I didn't get to uh, concerned uh, the the concerns, frankly, that this question has about the uh, the consequences on the water supply of such a big project with so much roofing, asphalt that uh, the runoff you would have, and and the potential uh, contamination of wells in the area, our our aquifer here in East Lyme, so. Uh, what are you doing uh, as first selectman, or would do as first selectman, uh, you know, concerning about those concerns about a project that size and the runoff that it would produce? First of all, I heard a, a bad rumor over the last week about how we don't have water for this project. The very reason why we put the interconnection in and spent ten million dollars was for economic growth, was for this project. We have a thirty thousand square foot medical building being built right next to Bob's in the industrial park, did you know that? That wouldn't have happened without the interconnection. So uh, the project, it does sit on um, the town's aquifer, a whole commercial district does. God bless the people who came before us because they meant well. But, but they put a railroad track down the, down the shoreline and separated us from the water and they put, um, they put Flanders Road right on the aquifer. But there are such things as aquifer protection. We have a dynamite uh, inland water, um, inland wetlands uh, commission, planning commission, zoning commission, and our state's best business practices will be instituted to the best of my abilities and those commission's abilities. We will protect. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, you know, how would, uh, if you're a first selectman, how do you make sure that uh, problems aren't created with the uh, amount of runoff from a project of that magnitude? Well, if it, was, if it was built the way it was supposed to, through all the commissions and boards, then, then they should follow that and, and protect the aquifer, and there shouldn't be any problems. If there is, then we'll step up to the plate and, and, and make, hold them accountable. All right. Um, okay, we're going to move now. Uh, we're up against the hour. We're going to move to our one-minute uh, closing statements by a flip of the coin. Uh, Mr. Carpenteri will be going first, followed by Mr. Nickerson. So you have one minute. Uh, the timekeepers will show you a card uh, as you're getting uh, towards the end of your time. And so we begin with Mr. Carpenteri. Again, I would like to thank everyone for spending the evening with myself and Mr. Nickerson. I hope we've been able to answer your questions and leave you with a better understanding 
of our individual views on the issues that face the town. We need leaders that will listen to our citizens and take their concerns and goals into consideration and not run our town based on the goals of the people in office. I assure you I'm a leader who will listen and solve the problems that need to be solved. In closing, I will leave you with this. I have no agenda other than to serve the people of this town to the best of my ability as your first selectman. I'm an everyday man working for everyday people. And let's remember, it is all about the town. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Nickerson. Thank you, Paul Chenier. Thank you, The Day, for putting this together. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for coming out and supporting this. And thank you, audience, for being so attentive and so polite tonight. And thank you, Steve, for being such a gentleman. It's been a great blessing to raise my family here in East Lyme. This is a community that's so special. It's an honor to serve as East Lyme, uh, East Lyme's first selectman and be part of its rebirth right from the very start 16 years ago. With 10 years as chair of zoning, five years as deputy first selectman, and as the current first selectman, um, I hope you, under, uh, hope you agree that I'm the best qualified for, for the job. It's been a privilege and an honor to serve this town as first selectman, empowering our department heads and employees to be the best they can be finding efficiencies in the system, meeting and listening to our town residents and delivering the best solutions to the issues. East Lime's a wonderful town with so much going forward. I ask the voters to continue to move the town forward in the right direction, to continue the momentum. I ask for your vote. My name's Mark Nickerson. I ask for your vote on November 3rd. All right, thank you. You can applaud now. You've been a great, very respectful audience. We appreciate it very much.